Ivor the Engine and the Dragon Story by Oliver Postgate Pictures by Peter Furman <laughs> Went Ivor's whistle as they rounded the bend above Flanyog. He wasn't whistling a warning, he wasn't whistling a signal. He was whistling for the joy of being alive and steaming. For the joy of seeing the cows in the fields and the sheep on the hills and the big wheel of the pit spinning in the sunshine. See that hill on the left, said Jones the Steam, Ivor's driver. That is called Smoke Hill. Some say it was once a volcano. What? Smoke? Why, so there is. And there was. Ivor stopped beside Smoke Hill, and Jones ran up this hill. The smoke was coming out from under the loose stones on top of the hill. He touched one. It was very hot. Jones fetched the big fire tongs and began to shift the stones. Under the stones, he found something amazing. Red hot it was, and big as a rugby football. Very gingerly, Jones lifted it with the tongs and carried it down to Ivor. What do you reckon that is? he asked, placing it gently on the footplate. Ivor didn't know. No, neither do I, replied Jones. I reckon we'd better take it up and show it to Mr. Dinwiddie. He's a gold miner. If anybody knows about rocks, he does. So they took the red hot object up to the gold mine. Mr. Dinwiddie looked at it wisely and prodded it with a bony finger. Psst, ow! It's red hot! Yes, we know that, said Jones. What we don't know is what to do with it. I reckon that thing is red hot because it's supposed to be red hot. So you better put it back in the red hot hole where you found it, said Mr. Dinwiddie. Oh, oh yes, it's time for Ivo's choir practice. I'll put it in Ivo's firebox. We can take it back later. The thing, whatever it was, in Ivor's firebox was as hot as a hundred weight of best coal. Ivor steamed like the wind down to Grumbly Town, where Evans the Song, the choirmaster, and the Grumbly and District Choral Society were waiting. Ah, there you are, Ivor, said Mr. Evans in his tuneful voice. Well, now we're all met, shall we sing? Evans the Song lifted his little white stick and they began their choir practice. Tap, tap, tap. Evans tapped on his music stand. Just a moment, please. The choir stopped singing. But from somewhere, a fine treble voice continued the song. Somebody is still singing, said Evans. He looked around. It was almost as if the singing came from inside Ivor's boiler. The thing! shouted Jones. He whipped open Ivor's fire door. What thing? asked Evans the song. It's broken! Look! said Jones. On the red hot coal they saw a heap of pieces just like the shell of a huge egg. Do you know land of my fathers? Eh? Hey? They looked up. There, looking out of Ivor's funnel, was a dragon. Not one of your lumping great fairy tale dragons. It was a small, trim, heraldic Welsh dragon, glowing red hot and smiling. Do you know, land of my fathers? Evans the song stopped gaping and remembered his manners. Why, yes, of course, of course, and very suitable for the occasion, if I may say so. Come, ladies and gentlemen, uh, engines and uh, dragons, 
Land of my fathers, if you please. They sang. They sang most beautifully, as always, and the dragon's voice was the clearest and most beautiful of all. Their sang rang through the streets and the houses and the gasworks and echoed from the hills, golden in the light of the evening sun. Ivor's firebox is really a very comfortable place for a red-hot dragon to roost. Idris, that was the dragon's name, was quite pleased to move in and travel about with Ivor, but Dye Station, the station master, did not agree. He fetched the Book of Regulations and a large cat basket. Conveyance of livestock, he read. All livestock to be conveyed in the proper container. So if you please, Mr. Dragon. Do you want me to climb into the basket? Asked the dragon anxiously. I'm afraid I must insist, said Di. The dragon climbed into the basket. It burst into flames. I was afraid that might happen. Fire! Fire! shouted Di, and he ran for the fire bucket. No! No! shouted the dragon. Not water! Water is certain death, the dragons! Di did not hear him. He threw the bucket of water, but the dragon had shot straight up into the sky like a rocket. Oh, Di! You could have killed him! cried Jones. Where is he now? With his little wings buzzing, the cooling dragon was circling the town to find a red hot place. He felt the blast of the heat from Eli the baker's oven and dived straight down the chimney. He's at Eli the baker's, shouted Jones. Come on, Di, run! Eli the baker opened his oven door and pulled out a line of hot loaves. He blinked short-sightedly at the last one. There's fancy bread now! That's not bread! That's our dragon! shouted Jones, bursting in through the door. Oh, brrr, I am cold! wailed the dragon. Quick as a flash, Eli opened the furnace. In you get! Oh, thank you! Oh, that's better! sighed the dragon as he settled on the blazing coal. There's the trouble, Eli, explains Jones. Idris is a red-hot dragon. He has to be kept red-hot at all time. And livestock has to be conveyed in the proper container, said Di. Only what is the proper container for a red-hot dragon? Eli the baker thought for a moment. Then he smiled a broad smile. I think I might have sold it for scrap or, or thrown it away, but no. I said to myself, one day, someday we'll need it. What are you talking about? said Jones. Come and see. Under the shed roof at the back of Eli's yard was a... Well, what was it? Looks like a tricycle, said Di. There's a cork stove at the front. Chestnuts, shouted Jones. Whoa. That's right said Eli. I used to sell roast chestnuts, but I gave that up years ago. I thought we could make a fire. Yes, and your dragons could, of course, while you pedal it along. Marvellous. So that's what they did. And Jones pedaled the smoking tricycle through Flanyog Town. You're selling chestnuts now? called Mrs. Williams, the post office. No, just dragons, laughed Jones. There's enterprising for you, said Mrs. Williams, the post office. You might think a red-hot dragon about the place would be a nuisance, but Di and Jones soon got used to looking after him, and he really was no trouble. In fact, he could be quite useful, like the time when the whole of the choir decided to go to Mrs. Thomas's fish and chip shop. Sixteen cotton chips, please, Mrs. Thomas, said Evans the song. Sixteen? wailed poor Miss Thomas. The gas burner is playing up. I can't seem to get the flyer hot. So there is only one thing to do. Idris is a bit of shy, really. But this was an emergency. Jones told him what had happened, and he left Ivor's firebox and flew down to the shop. 
What's this? cried Mrs. Thomas in alarm. Oh, just our friend Idris the dragon, said Emmons soothingly. He must oblige us with a few fiery breaths, then you will have fire and warmth all glowing under the fryer, and we shall have fish and chips. And so it was. Idris sat under the fryer and blew and blew. Soon the fat began to sizzle, and soon the shop was full of the lovely smell of fish and chips and the happy sound of eating. I say, George, said Evans, this to what's written in my bit of paper. Dragons at Laniog. Unconfirmed reports have been received that a genuine Welsh dragon has been sighted at Laniog. The Antiquarian Society states that its representative is to make an immediate investigation. There, Idris, you're going to be famous. No, cried Idris. No, dragons are mythical. No, I must not be investigating. No, no, no. With a whistle of red hot wings, Idris was away through the window and gone. Well, ladies and gentlemen, announced Evans the song. I think we haven't seen any dragons, isn't it? Dragons, said the choir. What dragons? Oh, lovely fish and chips, Mrs. Thomas. Jones the steam ran back to Ivor on the siding. He opened the firebox door. Idris was not in there. Oh, Ivor, shouted Jones. Idris has flown. The newspaper says he is to be investigated and he doesn't want to be. Come on, let's see if he's in the ash heap by the shed. Idris was not in the ash heap. He was not in Eli's furnace. He was not in the chestnut barrow. There was no sign of him anywhere. Oh, I do hope he is found somewhere hot, sighed Jones. Oh, I do wish we knew where he has got to. He went home that night feeling very sad and worried. The next morning, as Jones was talking to Dice Station on the platform, PC Gregory rode up on his bike. Have you seen the dragon? shouted Jones. Shh! hissed the policeman. There's a lady in the town asking for you. Very posh she is. I think she is the investigation. Oh dear, muttered Jones. I'm not good at telling lies. If she asks me, I shall tell her everything. Yeah! came a well-bred yell from behind. Jones spun round. There was Mrs. Griffiths of the Antiquarian Society. She was a large lady in a hat. Ah -ha! She hooted. You must be Mr. Jones, the engine driver. Yes, I must, said Jones reluctantly. And this is Ivor. Uh, say hello to the lady, Ivor. Ivor was silent. Ivor, said the lady, puzzled. Uh, which of you gentlemen is Ivor? Uh, the engine, madam, whispered P.C. Gregory. Does he always speak to it? Oh, yes, madam, we don't take any notice of that, said P.C. Gregory. Mrs. Griffiths gulped and spoke again. The little dragon, she began. I hear that you have sighted a dragon. Sighted? cried Jones. I've hatched it from an egg, and he fried fish and chips for us, and Mrs. Thomas's. Sixteen cotton chips. Ah, sixteen. That's right. And he sang like an angel right out of Ivor's funnel. Didn't he, Ivor? Ivor did not answer. Oh, come on, Ivor. Ivor remained silent. I'm very sorry, said Jones. Ivor isn't usually so rude. Oh, well, never mind, never mind. I'm sure everything is all right, really. Everything is not all right, said Jones, beginning to feel angry. We have lost our dragon. Ah, well, you know how it is with dragons, said Mrs. Griffiths soothingly. Here today, gone tomorrow. Is it indeed, said Jones. I can tell you, we shall miss him. Oh, we shall all miss him, sighed Mrs. Griffiths. But you never met him, shouted Jones. Mrs. Griffiths backed away. 
this Mr. Jones who talked to railway engines and said he had a dragon to cook fish and chips was obviously balmy. Good morning everybody, she yelled and trotted briskly back to her car. What a strange lady, said Jones. Di and PC Gregory were falling about with laughter. Uh, you're the one that's strange, laughed PC Gregory. Talking to railway engines, who ever heard of such a thing? Well, I reckon that's the end of the investigation, said Di, thankfully. It's about time you and Ivor did some work. It's Grumley Gasworks today. Off they went on their day's work. Quite an ordinary day's work it was. Coal for the gasworks, tomatoes and potatoes from Mr. Davis, the greengrocer, half a mowing engine for Mr. Pugh at Terran Farm. As they rolled homeward at the end of the day, Jones felt tired and still very worried. If only we knew where he was. Ivor jammed on his brakes. They were by Smoke Hill. Jones ran up and turned over the hot stones. In the red hot centre of the hill, he saw a curled up bundle of scales and claws. Idris was fast asleep. Jones put down the stones and walked quietly back to Ivor. That's the best place for him, I reckon, he said. We'll drop in a bag or two of coal now and then, if the weather goes cold. Come on, Ivor, time to go home. Jones the steam put Ivor to bed in his shed and went home to tea as if nothing would happen.